This is CBC Here and Now. Well, an absolutely beautiful day out there across the province. Hope you enjoyed it because those temperatures are coming down. The opportunity of, of 14 injections today, which you know, we'll do our best to you know, regroup, but again, I, I, I don't have, I just don't have the information. On it. The struggle to get vaccine in central Newfoundland. As the clusters in the region put stress on the hospital system. Vast, vast majority of people, the rules are very simple travel, you've got to be vaccinated. Vaccines are mandatory if you want to travel. And if you work for the federal government. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. We begin tonight with signs of strain on the health care system. The near record levels of COVID-19 hospitalizations is forcing Central Health to adapt. Here and Now's Peter Cowan is here with the latest. So Peter, what kind of numbers are we seeing? Well, Carolyn, there are 14 people in the hospital and they're all from the central region. And in central, it's hosp the hospital in Grand Falls, Windsor that's handling these patients. So they have room for up to 19 patients with COVID and five of those rooms are being used right now. So there is more capacity if more people get sick and need to go to the hospital. But it's the people who need to be intense in intensive care that's causing the real crunch. Let me break down those numbers for you. So there are nine ICU beds, but only five of them are available for COVID patients. But right now there are six people in the ICU in Central. So how are they doing that? Well, they've had to use what they call surge capacity to create more beds. Even with that, though, two patients were sent to St. John's because there wasn't the capacity in Central. Now, the good news is Central Health says it hasn't had to cancel procedures or scale back non COVID care, but it has needed help. Registered nurses from other parts of the province have come in for five to seven days and they've had to do some juggling other ways. There is a redistribution of um, non COVID work between Gander and Grand Falls, uh, demonstrating very nicely how those two facilities can work together to provide a complete service to the people of Central. So um, hats off to uh, the staff uh, in Central Health. So now let's take a look at today's numbers. They announced nine new cases today. Two of those are in Eastern, the other seven are in Central. But thanks to 30 recoveries, our active case count continues to come down. There's now 132 active cases. The, num the falling numbers of new cases and active cases is a good sign. And today the acting chief medical officer of health says it shows that they have made some good progress in the three clusters they're dealing with in Central. Really, we're, we're, doing, we're doing fairly well. Uh, pu the public health team worked incredibly hard. Um, they were able to contact and trace people. People were also really cooperative in um, isolating when they were asked to, getting tested when they um, were asked. And, uh, you know, we were very fortunate. We did have to close one school, um, but it's my understanding that that school um, will be opening up uh, in, the next, in the coming days. Now we are expecting another briefing tomorrow. The focus of that is going to be details on the vaccine passport. So we're hoping that we'll be able to find out where you're going to need them, when it's all going to come into effect, and we'll have those details for you tomorrow night, Anthony. All right, thank you, Peter. Much more COVID news to come. Now, wait lists and cancellations have frustrated some patients who are looking for their first COVID-19 vaccination in central Newfoundland. The province urging people to roll up their sleeves, but some pharmacies say they haven't been getting enough shipments to fulfill the new demand for those vaccines. Here now is Garrett Barry is digging into this issue and he joins us live from our Gander studio. Garrett. Anthony, uh, health officials do say that help is on the way, but some patients in central Newfoundland have been finding it difficult to get that first COVID-19 shot. Dozens of patients in Grand Falls, Windsor had their appointments cancelled this week, and that's just at one pharmacy. Across the province, there are wait lists at others, and that's because pharmacies say they haven't been getting enough Moderna vaccine to keep up with the growing supply. Last week, the Central Pharmacy in Grand Falls, Windsor ordered 10 vials. Yesterday evening, they received one vial. Ken Dix is the pharmacist there. He calls that outrageous. His pharmacy has canceled clinics yesterday and again today, and he doesn't know yet when he can reschedule. Wasted the opportunity of, of 14 injections today, which you know, we'll do our best to you know, regroup. But again, I, 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 don't have, I just don't have the information on you. I wish I did, but I don't. 
For the most part, these are patients looking for their first dose of COVID vaccine. These are individuals responding to the latest pleas by health officials to get their shot. In some cases, it's taken long conversations to make them feel comfortable with the vaccine. The pharmacist worries what's going to happen when these appointments get canceled. So when there's another little hiccup, would you lose them? I don't know, but it's just, you know, it's an interruption. It's another slot that you got to delay. It's somebody who's going to get an injection, you know, later in the process, you know, it, especially in central right now, because we've got, uh, you know, basically three significant clusters going on in our area. Uh, this, this would be an opportune time to have supply reliably available. This is all happening, of course, as an outbreak puts some serious strain, as you heard, on healthcare resources in Central. According to the Provincial Pharmacy Association, the vaccine supply crunch in Central Newfoundland started late last week. Today, Health Minister John Hagee blamed a software computer issue. He says help is on the way. It would appear that there was an issue with the ordering software uh, from the depot in Central. Uh, we have remedied that. Uh, those orders have been, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, are, will be fulfilled over the course of the next uh, day or so. And there is plenty of vaccine now uh, heading towards Central. So uh, uh, apologies to those people who were inconvenienced. Uh, we will uh, make sure it doesn't happen again. So more vaccine is on the way, but it's not as simple as getting that vial, opening it up and calling the next person in line. There's a lot of coordination involved to make sure there's no wastage. That's why some pharmacists are recommending to their patients that they call around, see which pharmacy might be in the position to put off a clinic in the next couple of days. Given the outbreak and the importance of vaccinations, Ken Dick says it would be awfully nice if they could make this a little bit easier for patients. Anthony. All right, Garrett, that's Garrett Barry. Thank you very much for reporting live from Gander, a story that's going to raise some eyebrows, no doubt. Now, with Thanksgiving coming this weekend, the acting chief medical officer of health is encouraging smaller family gatherings. It's also a time um, when we gather together indoors, we share food, so um, we have that risk of, uh, of transmission. We also have uh, running around uh, the kitchen and the house um, our, our children who are not vaccinated. So um, in asking people to um, limit their um, family size to 20, we know that that's going to have an impact on transmission. If there is COVID that's introduced into the house, we also know it's, uh, it's a number that will help us keep any stress off our um, acute care system and it's also a number that allows us to um, adequately contact trace um, people at an event. Well, if you were anywhere near the water today, this is what you saw. This was uh, Fort Amherst this morning. The uh, remnants of what was Hurricane Sam offshore causing uh, some pretty high waves earlier today. So certainly a spectac spectacular sight if you got to see it. And uh, like I said, the reason for that is Hurricane Sam or what was Hurricane Sam, but that is well offshore now. Uh, but as we head through the night tonight and then into the day tomorrow, actually, we're going to finally see these waves subside at least through tonight. We'll, uh, we'll see that and then into the morning tomorrow. By the time we get into Thursday afternoon, even Friday, uh, those seas will be back to normal. So if you do plan on heading out, just be safe. Uh, keep your distance for sure, but they are beautiful. <laughs> Temperatures today, absolutely gorgeous out there. 17 degrees in St. John's, topped out at 19 in Terranova. Same thing for Badger and Corner Brook. Those were the hot spots across the province. And then temperatures up across Labrador, absolutely beautiful as well. Uh, Nain, double digits, 10 degrees. Lab City at 13 this afternoon as well, but those things, it is going to change. We're going to see a shift in the pattern. Uh, developing area of low pressure going to bring some cooler temperatures thanks to that onshore flow. And then we're going to watch that system for Friday night into Saturday, looking like a pretty high wind event for eastern areas of the at least the eastern half of the island. But I'll get into those details when I come back.
Thanks, Ashley. Well, a woman died in an accident yesterday involving an ATV and a motorcycle. It happened on Route 391 off the Trans-Canada Highway near Springdale. The motorcycle was traveling on the road and the ATV was crossing it, to towing a small cart. A 31-year-old woman who was a passenger on the motorcycle died at the scene. The driver of the motorcycle received serious injuries while the driver of the ATV was uninjured. Well, in other news, police pulled nine drivers off the road over the weekend for impaired driving offenses. On Friday afternoon, a 29-year-old man was arrested in Nain. That same day, a 63-year-old man was stopped near Steadybrook. Police in Bay St. George made three arrests on Saturday, one in Robinson's involving a St. John's man who police say was also driving with an armed firearm. Two men near Stephenville Crossing were also arrested. One didn't have a driver's license registration or insurance. Police suspect a 40 year old woman from Holyrood of driving impaired, but she refused a breath sample. On Sunday, three more people were arrested. Each of those nine drivers was issued a driving suspension and had their vehicles seized and impounded. Well, yesterday, the NLC announced that it suspended the sale and use of its hand sanitizer pending further information from Health Canada. Well, now it's gone one step further. Rocks Spirits started making this hand sanitizer at the start of the pandemic. Now the NLC, working with Health Canada, is starting a voluntary recall of the product. The NLC says it's a result of some testing by Health Canada. It says there have been no health effects reported. The company says the testing problems are with some specific lots of the product, but it's going to discontinue and recall all of it until the Health Canada investigation is complete. Well, returning now to our COVID coverage, Premier Andrew Fury met with religious leaders from across the province this week to talk about the importance of getting vaccinated. A Pentecostal church in Bishop's Falls was linked to spreading COVID-19 in one of the clusters in Central. Well, tonight, a Pentecostal pastor in St. John's is speaking out, saying he's encouraging his parishioners to get vaccinated. When the virus first came, I think we were all saying, we need a vaccine, we need a vaccine and we were all waiting and anticipating. And then when the vaccine was discovered, it was like, how quickly can we get it? <laughs> but, you know, I've told the congregation here that I was vaccinated and I made a comment, you know, that, hey, science and hospitals and doctors and medical people are a gift from God and we, we thank God for that and we embrace it. Now, the Elam Pentecostal Tabernacles, Fred Penny, sat down for an interview with Here and Now's Mark Quinn, and we're going to bring you that entire interview in 20 minutes. Federal public servants and anyone planning to travel in the next few weeks will need to be fully vaccinated by the end of this month. Ottawa released vaccine mandates for both sectors today. The Prime Minister says there will be few exceptions. If you've done the right thing and gotten vaccinated, you deserve the freedom to be safe from COVID-19, to have your kids safe from COVID, to get back to the things you love. And if you haven't gotten your shots yet, but want to travel this winter, let's be clear. There will only be a few extremely narrow exceptions, like a valid medical condition. For the vast, vast majority of people, the rules are very simple. To travel, you've got to be vaccinated. These travel measures, along with mandatory vaccination for federal employees, are some of the strongest in the world. Because when it comes to keeping you and your family safe, when it comes to avoiding lockdowns for everyone, this is no time for half measures. And there are dates for this. You'll need to be fully vaccinated by October 30th to board planes, trains or marine vessels. Trudeau says any workers who aren't fully vaccinated by or aren't vaccinated by October 29th will be put on unpaid administrative leave. We'll have more on today's announcement that's ahead in about 25 minutes on Here and Now. In other news, Trudeau says he regrets taking a family trip to Tofino, B.C. last Thursday. That was the country's first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, designated to reflect on the impact of residential schools and honor its victims. Today, the Prime Minister called that trip a mistake. Traveling on September 30th was a mistake, and I regret it. The first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation was a time for Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people alike 
to reflect and connect, think about the past, but also focus on the future. I want to thank uh, Chief Casimir of De Kamloops uh, for the conversation we had over the weekend, in which I apologized for not being there uh, with her and her community uh, for this important day. And I committed to uh, going to visit the De Kamloops Te Suetmuk uh, community uh, in the coming weeks. By day, she's a manager at the Marine Institute, but by night, she has made it a mission to come up with the perfect raincoat. I wanted to go to where I was going the way I left the house, dry. That story's coming up. Well, you're definitely going to need a raincoat in the next couple of days. You're also going to need a warmer jacket. These 10 to 7 to 10 degree temperature differences over the next couple of days. Time for a look at the weather, but first we have some video to show you mm -hmm. from earlier. Um, we saw waves out at Fort Amherst here in St. John, so just take a look at this. Wow, that's a great shot there. That is fantastic. <laughs> 
Not very often that you see that for sure. Uh, looks like uh, those visitors could practically feel the spray of the waves out of Cape Spear this morning. Certainly not for the faint of heart. Giant. Yeah. I wonder if surfers would enjoy that or if it would be too much, probably be too much. You never know. I mean, I know lots of them go out <laughs> for sure. Uh, in fact, the uh, waves this morning topped out between 8 and noon, I think it was, about 5.8 meters out there Cape Spear. So certainly really high wind, uh, rather high surf today. But uh, the other thing you noticed was how beautiful the temperatures were today. In fact, very different from yesterday. Uh, Gander 10 degrees warmer. Same thing in St. John's about seven degrees warmer than we saw yesterday. But uh, it was a cool start to the day. Only about five degrees in St. John's when you woke up. Minus two in Badger. That was the cold spot. Saw those clear, calm conditions last night, allowing that temperature to drop. Uh, but rebounded absolutely beautifully up to 19 degrees in Badger today. And then a number of areas seeing those temperatures in the teens. Hopefully you enjoyed them because we will see those temperatures dip uh, as we head towards Friday, but uh, up until we get there, a fairly quiet a couple of, or at least the next 24 hours will be fairly quiet. Uh, not a whole lot happening right now. We do have a cold front that's moving through. That's uh, bringing some cooler, but not just a little bit cooler air. Uh, to the north of that to the south of that is where we're seeing some of that warmer air and not a whole lot happening. Just some cloud cover skirting through northern uh, portions of the island today and then some cloud cover up across Labrador as well. And if we take a look at the future tracker for tonight, just the chance of some scattered showers, mainly for central and coastal Labrador, but we uh, we may see that for the north as well, and then potentially a few showers skirting the northern peninsula. That's a very slight chance. Overall, it should be a fairly quiet night tonight, um, but we'll probably see some cloud cover along the southern portion of the island, then some more showers will move in for you for Lab West as you get into the early morning hours. Temperatures tonight uh, pretty well ranging actually going to keep that temperature in around the zero degree mark through central again. You may see that dip below zero uh, through the overnight, but overall temperatures between five to 10 degrees coolest in the south uh, or rather warmest in the south. St. John should go down to about nine degrees tonight. Those winds out of the west uh, anywhere from 20 to 40 kilometers per hour, but out of the northwest as you head towards the west coast. Uh, winds will generally be easing for lab, uh, lab west as well. Temperature around 2 degrees as your overnight low tonight for you. As we head through the day tomorrow, first half of the day, another beautiful one, except uh, we will see the temperatures a little bit cooler than today. And that's because we're going to see a bit of a wind shift, uh, but overall, Unsettled day up across Labrador, a little bit more cloud cover in play. Also that chance of showers and some cooler temperatures as well. So up towards northern Labrador, you may see a few uh, flakes in the mix as well with some of those showers and then shower activity expected uh, as we get into the afternoon hours for Lab West and then towards central Labrador as well. Temperatures are going to dip and then we could see the chance of some wet snow. Um, most of the day absolutely beautiful across the island, but we will start to see some increasing cloud and with that some showers into the evening and overnight hours. It looks like some periods of rain will roll through and this is that developing low uh, pressure system that I was talking about yesterday looking more and more likely like that will happen and it could bring some significant rain with it as well through the day on Friday into Saturday and potentially continuing into Sunday. So I'll certainly get into some of those details a little bit later, but uh, as far as tomorrow goes, like I said, another beautiful day cooler though, but you will still it will still feel nice under that sunshine with those winds out of the west about 20 to 40 kilometers per hour as you head towards central similar forecast. Same thing for the south coast about 13 degrees for Harbor Breton. 12 to 14 for the West Coast as well. Same thing for the Northern Peninsula, maybe a degree or two colder. And then things get unsettled as you head towards Labrador. Cartwright, eight degrees tomorrow, 11 in Happy Valley Goose Bay, nine in Lab City with those winds out of the Northwest. And there's where we're gonna start to see that chance of showers mixed in with some flurries. So that's a look at tomorrow's forecast. I'll get into the details for the weekend when I come back. Well, they say that there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothes. Well, one St. John's woman wanted to put that to the test by trying to design the perfect raincoat. Right now you can find Mernini designs in downtown storefronts, but soon it'll be on a national stage. We caught up with designer Maria Halfyard in her living room, also known as her design studio. This is basically where you develop the idea, right? 
yeah, so I have my business downstairs. I do all my, my fulfillment from here. Uh, I just hired a work term student from Memorial to help me this fall. So yeah, it's getting busier, uh, but it fills up my nights. This is it in all its glory. It's a full length raincoat. It's 48 inches long. It's basically gonna cover your entire outfit. If you have good rubber boots on, um, it's an industrial design, something like the old rain slickers uh, that uh, they used to wear. Um, and so it's made of polyurethane. It has a cotton backing. Our rain comes with a lot of wind. So I was kind of tired of running to the car, getting half my outfit soaked. So I wanted to design something that was full length, uh, but also had that kind of embraced our rich maritime culture. So this magnetic uh, feature, that front flap, just automatically closes and you're in and out in no time. These are wrist warmers. Oh, wrist warmers. So some co people call them the thumb hole warmers, but uh, this is so that basically no rain gets up your sleeve. And we have cold falls and spring, so it keeps your hand nice and toasty. And I also featured this beautiful uh, rock label. So it's actually made out of rock. So I kind of wanted to represent where the design originated from the rock. So tell us how this all got started because you work at the Marine Institute. Well, uh, my day job, I manage research and development. So I help people bring their ideas to life. So I had this idea because I was just tired of getting half my outfit soaked. I, I wear a lot of Canadian fashion and I wanted to go to where I was going the way I left the house, dry. So I wanted to design something. I couldn't find anything that I liked, so I put a sketch together and hired a fashion designer in Montreal to put it to life. When, when I started to look at long raincoats or raincoats in general, I looked at the companies behind them and who started the company. And usually it started with just one or one or two people and it started with one product. And I said, if, I, if they can do it, I can do it. And I looked around at all the coats coming out of Canada. There was nothing really East Coast, you know, that East Coast flair. And I was like, we know the rain, <laughs> we know really bad weather the most. Why can't there be a product coming out of this side of the country? So I said, I'm just going to do it. And uh, a lot of research. It took me a few years to get it going, but uh, I loved every minute of it. You launched this just fairly recently during the pandemic. Yeah, uh, June 2020. Tell me about that. Um, well, it was delayed a little bit because my supply chain obviously slowed down a little bit because of the pandemic. But um, I found that actually launching in the pandemic turned out to be a blessing because people were home, they were shopping online, but also that they really reconnected with nature and they wanted to go outside. So what better way to spend the day than in a Mernini in the rain? Where does the name come from? Um, so I have five siblings. So my name is Maria. Uh, it was really hard to say that. People were like, Ma Wiwa or you know something so they just started calling me Mernini so it's, it's shortened a little bit now it's called the kids call me Aunt Nini but that's where it came it's, it's really me and so now you're getting some national attention as well can you tell us about that yeah so I have always been interested in getting my product on TV so I reached out to today's shopping choice which was previously known as the shopping channel uh, a year ago and then reached out to Jeannie B Becker uh, in April and just showed her my product, told her my story, uh, and then they picked me up shortly after that. So they, we debut and launch the coats on uh, that uh, Style Matters show, her show, uh, tomorrow night. So we will Skype in from, from here to there. It's, it's probably going to be around 10 minutes and then we showcase the coats. They have models up there going to be wearing the coats. Uh, and then we'll just have a conversation about the brand and the story. Well, good luck with it. Thank you so much for telling us about it. Thank you. Coming up on Here Now, battling the bureaucracy. Matthew Butler, what was your experience here like? Misleading, erratic, confusing, and condemning. Okay, the full details on Matthew's story after the break.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, as public health continues to monitor COVID-19 cases linked to a Pentecostal church in central Newfoundland, the lead pastor at one of the province's largest Pentecostal churches says he's encouraging members to get vaccinated. The Elam Pentecostal Tabernacle's Fred Penny spoke with Here and Now's Mark Quinn. So first of all, what do you make of what's happening in Centre? We've heard a lot of news about a cluster that's been linked to a church in central Newfoundland. Yeah, I think I heard some stuff on the radio about it as well with CBC, and there seems to be some, some uh, correlation there. I, I'm not wanting to speculate on the reasons behind it. I think, you know, the people out there have given interviews. Um, I think there's, there's uh, a lot of anxiety in the population generally, which is surprising to me, in fact, because when the, when the virus first came, I think we were all saying, we need a vaccine, we need a vaccine. And we were all waiting and anticipating. And then when the vaccine was discovered, it was like, how quickly can we get it? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I was first in line, you know, to get my vaccine as early as I could. And, and then we got our second one as quickly as we could. And um, so I, I'm, I'm a bit surprised, actually. Uh, by the anxiety that's kind of developed. And social media, I think, has a lot to do with that. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. And does the Pentecostal Church have a position on the vaccine? Not, not an official position. I mean, here at the local church, we encourage people to get the vaccine, but we also obviously have to respect people's individual right to choose. And we don't want to guilt anybody, anybody into it positive or negative. But, you know, I've told the congregation here that I was vaccinated and I made a comment, you know, that, hey, science and hospitals and doctors and medical people are a gift from God and we, we thank God for that and we embrace it. And people have been sort of linking hesitancy to the church and I'm guessing people are speculating that maybe people who have, you know, faith in things that science can't explain may be more likely to doubt science. Do you think there's something to that? Uh, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's a funny question, eh? Um, science has its skeptics. Um, but the way I look at it, Mark, is science is a reflection of the created order. There is pre precision and laws that govern uh, the universe and nature. And those laws and that precision reflects a divine creator. And so science is the outworking of how God has created an ordered world. Uh, that's what makes science possible. And throughout history, I think there's been a bit of a, a tension, you know, over the 2000 years of Christian history, there's been a bit of a tension between scientific discoveries and new realities and, and how that's received. So that's not new, but uh, that tension, I think, will always exist. Uh, but many, many scientists over the history uh, of science, last 500 years in particular, let's say, uh, are of Christian heritage and Christian values. So, so we, we, uh, we believe that it was Augustine who said about 1,500 years ago, all truth is God's truth. And, and we affirm that. And uh, I understand there are sort of, uh, I don't know if it's divisions is the right word, but there are different beliefs among different members of the Pentecostal church. Yeah. Um, in your church, for example, do you get a sense that most people are vaccinated? Yes, yes. So here, you know, myself, our church, you know, we're, we're uh, very much orthodox Christians within the historic teachings of the Christian church. And... Uh, um, we're members of the evangelical community. We're members of the Christian community and we have fellowship you know, with all levels of the Christian church. Across the province, there are some independent Pentecostal churches. I couldn't tell you how many, but, but if they're independent, they, they have a little bit less accountability to a governing body. And you'll find that in mainland Canada, throughout the US and in fact, throughout the world. And are those independent churches more likely perhaps to be hesitant about vaccines? No, I wouldn't say so. 
some of them might be, uh, but I wouldn't say that would be a general statement, no. We don't hear from the Pentecostal Church a whole lot. Um, why did you choose to, to speak on this issue? Well, uh, at your invitation, your kind invitation, and, and um, I, I think it's important for the, the public uh, discourse to include the voice of the church. Um, and as I said, you know, we have many members in the medical community in our church. We want to affirm and support them. We have families and children in our church. They're going to school every day. They're going to work every day. And uh, yeah, we'd like to just celebrate the progress that's been made with the vaccine. We'd like to encourage people to get the vaccine. We'd like to encourage people, you know, that they don't need to live in fear and anxiety. They can live in, in security and in peace. Uh, the message of our church, of course, is rooted in the gospel, and the gospel is good news for all people, and we want to proclaim that good news. Well, I, I want to thank you for agreeing to speak with us. It was a pleasure to speak with you. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, earlier this week, Premier Andrew Fury met with religious leaders from across the province. In a statement to CBC News, the Premier's office says Fury discussed the importance of the COVID-19 vaccine and plans to implement Newfoundland and Labrador's vaccine passport. And as you heard earlier, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced mandatory vaccinations for several groups of people, including many federal workers and almost all travelers. The CBC's Ashley Burke has more. As Canadians start to travel again, the government's starting to restrict who exactly can fly. By the end of October, everyone 12 or older on a plane or train within Canada should be fully vaccinated. A promise the Liberals fiercely campaigned on, now one of the government's first orders of business post-election. There was very strong support for vaccine mandates. That mandate includes showing proof of vaccination before boarding a plane, train or cruise ship. Those still in the process of getting their shots can show a negative COVID-19 test until the end of November. And it's up to rail, cruise and airline companies to verify and turn the unvaccinated away. We need very rapidly as a priority to see from the federal government a standardized proof of vaccination and a digital form of, of proof of vaccination uh, for air travel. Some people flying today welcome the decision and hope it won't further complicate travel. I think it's a great idea. I don't want to get sick. It would be easier to have some kind of electronic passport. Like you have to show ID anyways. It's just another piece of information you're also showing. It's not just travelers facing new restrictions. Airline and rail employees will also need to be vaccinated. So will federal public servants. They'll have until the end of the month to self-declare their vaccination status, or else they'll be put on leave without pay unless there's valid religious or medical reasons. We're encouraging our members to, to get vaccinated. Uh, if there, there, there's reasons why they can't get vaccinated, certainly we will work with them uh, and we will, we will defend uh, the members that have any punitive action taken against them as a result of their vaccination status. More than 250,000 federal workers are covered under this new policy, but there are many who aren't, including at Crown Corporations, the military and the House of Commons. The government is urging those employers to roll out similar vaccine mandates. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, now a story about government red tape, maybe incompetence, you can be the judge. Matthew Butler has a story to share about what happened to him recently when he was pulled over. So Matthew, recently a police officer pulled you over. What happened? So I had old stickers from last year and I've already renewed my stickers. And all I had was a receipt uh, to prove that I paid for it. So of course, when I got pulled over, I knew immediately what it was for. And I handed him the receipt for the stickers I paid for. Normal routine traffic stop. Um, and he came back and to my surprise, he told me uh, that my license was medically suspended. So Matthew, what is a medical uh, suspension? A medical suspension is when the MRD determines that you're not medically fit to drive. So uh, an example could be a diabetic episode, a concussion to the head, epilepsy, a seizure. Right. Now in your case, have you been in a situation where you did have one of these um, situations? In the past, in 2018, yeah. I had a seizure, I had to go to the emergency room. The ER doctor informed me that it was a six month in, uh, suspension. Right. Um, it should have only lasted six months. I was informed that by the MRD. Yeah. Uh, I come to find out uh, almost a year later uh, that when I, when I first bought my car and got it registered here, that I still had that suspension on file. All right. Now, did this department actually inform you that this was on, or was this a was this a surprise when the police officer came to you and said, "Hey, you got a problem here"? Well, this is, it was actually a surprise because this uh, suspension was already was already done and dealt with when I got the car registered. You actually can't get a regi get any registration through unless you are clear of any parking fines, tickets or any other administrative fines from the MRD, including medical suspensions. Right, and I've looked at some of the electronic correspondence you've had, and it seems to indicate that, yeah, you can drive this car. So what kind of redress did you have when you approached this department about what had happened? So I called my ass, and I said, these stickers still aren't coming in, even though it says I'm good to drive, and I want to double check with you in case I'm pulled over. And I asked this employee, do I have any parking fines, speeding tickets, or medical suspensions that I don't know about. Right, and? I was told, no, you're clear, your file's clear. And they said, to prove that, with the mygov.nl website, you cannot make a payment and you cannot get a renewed registration on your vehicle unless those things, including the medical suspension and parking fines and speeding tickets, are taken care of. Okay, I can tell from your demeanor you're kind of ticked off by all this. What, what do you want? What I want, I, I want to warn people first, first and foremost. That's my biggest thing, biggest reason I'm going on record. I want to tell everyone who's had a medical suspension, an ER visit, or anything dealing with Eastern Health, or any encounter with the MRD that suggests they may not be medically fit to drive. Also, those who are 85 years of age or older and may have had a recent birthday. You might have a medical suspension on file and not know of it. You also may be due for a medical review and it may be your first time ever owing a medical review and you won't even know it. At any point, did the people and the bureaucrats in the building behind us, did they get in touch with you to tell you you cannot drive? The only time they ever got in touch with me was during my original suspension back in 2018. At no time during this year or any time after I first registered my vehicle was I ever notified by mail or by phone saying that I, I needed a, an, an additional review or I owed them a medical review or that I was suspended. So Matthew, after the police officer pulled you over, what did he tell you? Oh, his shock was uh, actually more expressive than mine. In fact, he even stated that it was actually very, very strange right. that they would hold on to something and, and for a medical suspension to go on that long and for me not to be contacted. Nonetheless, what happened to your car? He impounded it and it had to be in, impounded for 30 days. However, I do have to give credit. I did get help from my local MHA and I did happen to get it released early and she did uh, to, uh, talk to the M MRD and they All did right, agree this is to Lucy Stoyles here in Mount Pearl. It is. All right. Well, Matthew, uh, we'll try to get some answers about what happened to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Well, here now, ask for an explanation of Matthew Butler's case. Now, there appears to be a misunderstanding between getting registration and renewing a driver's license. In a statement, the department says when a driver license is suspended for any reason, the customer receives written notification, including the reason for suspension. But the statement goes on to say having a registered vehicle in the province is not related to the status of a driver's license. You do not have to hold a valid driver's license to register a vehicle. Now, if you have any questions about the status of either your registration or your driver's license, you can call 1-877-636-6867 or email registrarmrd at gov.nl.ca. A very special day for the Royal Regiment of the Canadian Artillery. The Canadian soldiers have assumed the Queen's Guard in the UK and today they received a visit from Her Majesty. It's the first time the regiment is undertaking public duties in the UK. The contingent is comprised of 90 soldiers, many based at Manitoba's CFB Shiloh. For the mount and dismount ceremonies, the guard will be accompanied by the Royal Canadian Artillery Band based in Edmonton. The Queen invited the regiment to form the guard for the 150th anniversary of its founding. They will serve as the Queen's Guard until October 22nd. Well, in other news, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says the military, quote, still doesn't get it when it comes to sexual misconduct in the Canadian Armed Forces. Trudeau was reacting to questions today about a general who expressed support for a convicted sex offender who will no longer work on the military's response to complaints of sexual misconduct. Major General Peter Daw was dropped from his new role amid growing public backlash. Traveling on September 30th was a mistake, and I regret it. The first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation was a time for Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people alike. <laughs>
Whereas Fat Cat or the Black Sheep, very fortunate to still have this room. There's a community in the Black Sheep. I remember it vividly, actually, the first day I held sticks. I want to capture the gigs. I want to capture the facial expressions. You're creating the song that you want to hear. That made me feel better listening to that. And maybe I can write my feelings out and see how I like that. It's really all about the music. Time for a look at the weather forecast. Ashley, looking at uh, the long range forecast, we're getting a little bit closer to the weekend, inching mm -hmm. closer and closer. Uh, how are things looking? It's uh, a little bit up in the air at this point, but it does look like there's a good chance we're going to see some pretty significant weather uh, this weekend. So let's take a look at uh, the future tracker for the next week or for the next couple of days anyway. So tomorrow uh, is going to be fairly quiet and then we're going to see that rain move in and continue for most of the day on uh, Thursday, but then we're watching that next area of low pressure developing. It looks like it should develop just offshore, but affect uh, potentially the Avalon and basically the eastern half of the island. So uh, we're looking at those winds uh, potentially gusting upwards of 100 kilometers per hour. Again, it'll depend on where that low develops and then also uh, some potentially locally heavy rain possible over the weekend as well. Time frame Friday night into and through Sunday uh, is when we should see that. And again, the Avalon and Bonavista Peninsula. So as that area of low pressure, it's going to be fairly large by the time we get into Sunday. So we will likely still see some gusty winds as well. And we may see a few showers continue uh, through uh, the afternoon hours as well. But again, it could be potentially significant. Definitely have some things to iron out with that one. But this is just a quick idea. Now this is the potential. This is just one model's idea of what could potentially happen uh, as far as those winds go. So Friday evening, we're starting to get into that potentially 80, 90 kilometer per hour gust. Most of eastern Newfoundland could see those gusts between 60 to 80 kilometers per hour. Then watch what happens as we get into Saturday afternoon. That's when that area of low pressure starts to really deepen and strengthen and we could see some of those gusts in excess of 100, maybe even 110 to some models pointing at about 120 kilometers per hour uh, with those wind gusts. So set, certainly something uh, to keep an eye on over the next couple of days. And then as we get into Sunday, still some pretty gusty winds right through Sunday or rather Saturday night into the first half of Sunday morning. And uh, eventually those winds will ease as we get into Monday. So this could be uh, a whole weekend event as far as those winds go. So temperatures, this is when we're going to start to see that dip as this area of low pressure develops. We're looking at those temperatures into the single digits uh, through the day on Friday. Same thing up through Labrador, going to keep that potential for some showers and or flurries in the mix, mainly in the morning hours because as that temperature climbs to eight degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay, that should fall as rain. And then for Saturday, there's where those windy conditions will be. So t similar temperatures, though only about nine degrees, going to uh, keep you out of it on the west coast for the most part. You may see a few showers uh, for Corner Brook, but uh, overall uh, not a bad Saturday for you. And then uh, beautiful up across Labrador, at least most of Labrador. Lab City, 14 degrees, so back up into those double digits. And Cartwright, you will sit around, um, I don't remember what that said. <laughs> But that's okay. So St. John's Eastern Newfoundland over the next couple of days, you can see those single digit highs continue. And uh, as far as central Newfoundland goes, same thing. So uh, temperatures by the time you get into Sunday and Monday, 11 to 14 degrees, uh, similar forecast for Western Newfoundland. So things will uh, improve for sure. And then for Eastern Labrador, back up into those teens, gorgeous uh, Sunday and Monday uh, for you. And then for Western Labrador, you're looking at a similar forecast. Look at that, finally, sunshine and lots of it. This probably will change, but as of now, that's what it looks like. Uh, and then 13 to 15 degrees as we get into Monday. Wanted to share uh, this great shot. Uh, this is the colorful fall sky in Rigolette. Kellyanne Blake shared that one with us. And if you have any weather photos, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Beautifully calm water. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous, giant sky. I wonder if we're going to be seeing a lot of the leaves coming off the trees this weekend with oh, all of that wind. Absolutely. Everything's starting to change. And yeah. I know my deck is starting to see all the leaves. And like a lot of them were ruined just because of uh, Larry. Right, They're yeah. A lot of wind burn and stuff, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a long weekend coming up, too. It so is. That's a good thing. Yeah. There you go. Something An extra day to rake. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's it for us tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Hope you can come again tomorrow.